Welcome back to Vote for Vermont. Uh, my name is Ben Kinsley. I am the co-host, co-producer of the show. Um, and tonight our host, uh, Pat McDonald, is out. She's uh, doing some traveling. So I have Executive Director of Campaign for Vermont, Eric, with me. Um, and we also have uh, a guest, a very uh, cool guest tonight. We have an interesting uh, topic to discuss. Uh, we have um, Betty from the uh, Vermont League of Women Voters, uh, the St. Alban or the St. Johnsbury chapter, correct? And uh, we're talking about uh, ranked choice voting and instant runoff voting, which is a very interesting topic. So, with that, we can um, we can dive right in. So, uh, Betty, tell us a little bit more about uh, ranked. Well, actually, first let's talk about you a little bit and um, to talk about your background. We ask all of our guests to do that, and then uh, talk about move on to the topic of the evening. So, I'm Betty Keller, as you said, and um, I guess the. The, for my, probably when I was 12 years old, I wouldn't have wanted to be introduced this way, but I'd say a pretty core part of my identity is I'm a PK, which is a preacher's kid. Okay. <laughs> and so um, my big life choices are based on what I um, believe I am called to do. Very cool. And so um, I uh, you know, grew up in my early years in Illinois. My father was um, going through college and seminary with my mother working full time and my grandmother caring for us in the home, which is just such a wonderful um, blessing that we had. And um, his first church was in rural Illinois and his first churches, he had two churches part time in each. And then his second set of churches was in East Montpelier, Vermont. So we moved here um, before uh, sixth grade for me, spent my first couple months on Joe's Pond until the parsonage was available. And uh, <clears throat> and um, thought I was going to go into journalism, and then in my junior year of college uh, decided that uh, I was doing a little one-week um, shadowing experience in Boston at Houghton Mifflin, and said, you know, I'm not really sure this is what I want to do. And so a lot of prayer and reflection, and decided that I was called to go into medicine, and went to UVM College of Medicine, trained for family practice, and. Um, including the full range, including obstetrics, um, at the University of Utah, Department of Family and Preventive Medicine, and served on the faculty there for a year. Um, worked in St. Johnsbury, family medicine obstetrics. Um, it was hard working full time. By that time I had three children. It was hard working full time and being on call every other day. So we thought we would try um, an HMO. Uh, CHP was in Burlington and um, see if part time work worked better, and uh, by that time I had worked in several different areas, um, several different venues, like in a, a university setting, a, um, an urban underserved setting, in uh, a, a private practice, you know, solo every, well, he had been solo, then it was us every other day, now I was doing the HMO setting, so I'd been in a variety of practice and said, you know, none of them really works right, <laughs> and uh, I'm not seeing my kids enough, and I, um, I don't want to practice medicine until we have a better system. I'm going to stay home with my kids. Um, the childcare had been tough, um, and so I just um, decided I was called to be home. And um, I've been home ever since. And as the kids grew, I started volunteering in more areas. Uh, and um, about 2004, I started doing media around racism in Vermont, and um, and then switched over to healthcare since I have a lot of expertise in that area so I could actually do a good job of interviewing people. Right. And, yep. um, and so uh, moved over toward that in the 2008-ish range, was very active while we were trying to get a universal healthcare system here in Vermont, which is the fiscally responsible way to provide healthcare for your citizens. And I firmly believe that Americans are smart enough that if all of Europe and Canada and Australia can all do it, then I'm sure that we can do it too. Um, just have to figure out politically how to get there. And so in the course of this, it came to me that until we can get our political system to work as a better democracy, more reflective of the people who live here, um, that we will not get a good healthcare system. So I, um, in 2000, so I think spring of 2016 is when I started becoming more active in the League of Women Voters. and uh, the. The draw for the League of Women Voters is it's nonpartisan and it's grassroots and it's just very firmly grounded on um, voter participation and encouraging people to be active participants. 
in the democracy, becoming informed, and um, that was that was just really calling to me as a way to try to make change. And you're a volunteer for those folks, correct? Right. I'm a, I have been a professional volunteer <laughs> for a while now. <laughs> right. I um I have volunteered for PNHP. That's the Physicians for National Health Care Pro, um, Health Program, and a volunteer at NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental yeah. Illness. Yep. And a volunteer, um, well, through my church, of course, the United Church of Christ. I was working on the Uprooting Racism Task Force is when I first got involved in the media, and um, and then uh, the League of Women Voters now. Wow. So, so tell us briefly a little bit more about League of Women Voters of Vermont, what your main focus areas are, what, what mission, right. what's your mission? Oh, so I guess I could just, for anybody who might be interested in participating with League of Women Voters, it's a national organization uh, since uh, 19, 19 or 20, right around the time women were getting the vote and we needed to teach women how do you vote. Um, how do you register? How do you vote? How do you make the time to get to the polls? And uh, how do you learn about the candidates and the issues enough to vote with, you know, as an informed citizen? And then working with immigrants over the years. Um, in the past, we have been much more open to our immigrants because we were immigrants. <laughs> um, you know, my own, you know, all of our families were immigrants unless we're 100% Native American. And so over the years, it's been important to teach our immigrants and our refugees to um, how to vote, how to be active participants in our democracy. and. Um, so that, that focus has been ongoing throughout um, the years of the League of Women Voters has been working. There are state chapters, and within each state there can be, so those are called leagues, and within each state there can be leagues also. So we have leagues um, in the Chittenden County area and in central Vermont. St. Johnsbury's not actually technically a league, we call it a unit because we're not big enough with enough paying members to call us a league. Um, but we're actually one of the most active areas in the state. Hmm. Um, and are there any other um, of those like chapters, those uh, in Vermont around the state? Yeah, there are little foci. That it just depends on your volunteers and who's who's busy and calls the meetings and when it drifts off. Um, in the White River Junction area, there was one an, a few years ago, and it just ran out of volunteers um, to put that you know that time into it. You have to either recruit new people or you know, you know people move. So um, so. Uh, you know, some of those have not been as active recently. Um, but the, 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 you know, there are folks in the Rutland area and the Bennington area, but they're, you know, various levels of activity. Gotcha. And what are the, like, kind of the main focus areas um, for the League right now? I know um, I've worked with a couple uh, folks of the League in the past on different policy mm -hmm. areas, but what's kind of the, what kind of the big um, broad strokes right now? That and you want to know in, in Vermont or in the nation? In, in Vermont specifically, Okay. Yeah. Um, Right. So, um, well, voter registration is always, a, you know, every year you have a new crop of 18-year-olds who have not voted before, right. and we want to get them all um, to feel like that is, you know, part of who they are, <laughs> that that's their responsibility and, um, and their blessing. And, uh, you know, we are on college campuses, we're at high schools, things like that, um, at citizen naturalization ceremonies, um, and also in the legislature, ad advocating for things like um, you know, voter registration, automatic uh, registration through voter um, th that, uh, driver's license and that sort of thing. Yep. We don't, a lot of those things have already been done in Vermont. We've Same day voter registration. Yeah, we have, yep. we have a, a, our state is actually pretty advanced as far as like having open primaries and not having states trying to get rid of voters off the polls um, just based on, oh, they missed one election or two elections and so we take them off the polls. We don't do that here. And um, so, so we don't have to, and we and our polling places are fair. We're not trying to make people travel 30 miles to get to a polling place, or closing them down in, in parts of town where the poor people live, or anything like that, which is happening across the country in a number of different places. And we don't have polling places getting changed at the last minute. Oh my gosh, when I was, um, this, so League of Women Voters is nonpartisan. So the next thing I'm going to tell you is something that I do as Betty Keller. I don't do it as a League of Women Voters. Okay, but when I was in New York City. Um, during the primaries, I was there for a reunion of a summer school um, program that I'd gone to, and uh, and I was knocking on doors for Bernie in Brooklyn, and so in Brooklyn, <laughs> the polling places changed. I was trying to tell people that it was um, their polling place was at that school, and they said, "Oh no, I got this notice from school saying that they're not going to be the polling place." So some. There was this mixed message of like, is it going to be at the school or not? Like, how 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 could you be changing this on the Friday before 
the election. <laughs> right. So, but we don't we don't do that kind of stuff here. At least yeah. I'm not aware of it happening here. Yeah, cool. Because it's pretty much always like a set a set place, and it, change, it doesn't change a whole lot. From yeah, I mean, you might have here. to change if you used to do it in the local Catholic school, and now you want to do it in a, a nonpartisan and non-religious place. So in St. John's, it used to be in in the Adam School. But then when they built a new school, it became Father Lively Center, and so it was a religious place, and then we moved it to our new school. So, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Right. It's not that hard to find where you're supposed to vote. And uh, the primary that was just a few weeks ago um, was uh, the first time, I believe, that we've actually implemented same-day voter registration. Like, it was the first vote where someone could go in and register the same day at their polling location. Uh-huh, okay. Um, so I, and I, I think the numbers are relatively low. I don't know that there's a whole lot of awareness about it the first time around, but... Right. Whenever you pass new legislation, there's a little lag until people right. figure it out. Yeah. 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 So um, so it's it's rolled out now, I believe, and, and hopefully people will take advantage of that. Right. So uh, other things the League of Women um, Voters do is to inform people about the candidates' positions. And it's not like we write up and can write something slanted about them. We send out questionnaires to them and ask them to send us. So it's in their own words. Right. Unfortunately, sometimes you have better response than others, and it's kind of a useless manual if only one party's candidates respond, and we can't really do anything with that because then it looks partisan. So, so we're in a little bit of a bind, and so um, right now we're in flux about how we do that candidate information, but we do continue to do our forums. Mm -hmm. um, so if a town asks us or if, um, uh, say the library wants to sponsor a forum or candidates from one party get together with candidates from other parties and they agree that they'd like a forum then um, or if can or if citizens just say hey can you guys organize this thing there's this thing going on in our town and um, then we will then we will take that on um, so two years ago I did one in um, Lunenburg when we were requested this fall, we're going to be doing, and we, and we did one in St. Johnsbury at that time, and this fall we're definitely doing one in St. Johnsbury. I'm not sure where else we've been asked in my local area, but that happens throughout the state. Yeah, one of the things I know from, um, you know, having worked with candidates in the past, mm -hmm. like, they, there's so many of these questionnaires that they get. Yeah. Um, it's hard to know, like, you know, how, how hard to find time to respond to all of them, I uh -huh. think is what a lot of it runs so into. So you think you might have a little copy and paste plan? And yeah, just there like, should this be is your position, pop it in they, there. Everyone should coordinate and <laughs> have exactly the same survey uh -huh. question that they can just copy paste and everything. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, so that's great. Are there any, like, legislative initiatives that you're leading into this year that are kind of going to be the focus? Um, um well, so the league has something that they call um, their program um, for the biennium, mm -hmm. and um, the the national organization does it on the even years. And the the national program is to make democracy work. And across the country, any state where gerrymandering is a big issue, they're focusing on gerrymandering. Yep. Other states where there has been. Um, and sometimes it's the same states um, where there are issues regarding polling places getting moved and things like that, then they're addressing that. Mm -hmm. um, in Vermont, we don't have issues with those things so much. Um, in our in our state program, we um, we decided to include um, civics education, and um, I think on, there's something on climate as well, um, and then also ranked choice voting. Mm -hmm. Now, ranked choice voting has been um, on the program a number of years ago, and actually um, they, they collaborated with a number of different nonprofit organizations, and in 99, I think it was passed in one house or the other, and then in 2000, it was passed in both houses, but the governor vetoed it. And um, a few years later, uh, Burlington, had um, asked to do ranked choice voting for its local elections, you know, city councilman, mayor, that sort of thing. And for a town in Vermont to do something major like that, they actually have to get state approval because it's their, their town charter. Right. Um, so they had to go through the state legislature. And the state did end up approving it. And then actually only uh, one or two years, like very few election cycles, um, they already turned around and came back and said, we don't want this. Right. Now, that's another whole story. Yeah, there's really a whole story. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole story behind that we might get to later. We might get to later. Yeah. But ranked choice voting has been used successfully in a number of places, and mm -hmm. there are a lot of, um, lot of strong benefits for it. 
And, um, and so I had wanted to look at trying to do that again and do better education around it this time. There wasn't enough education for the Burlington voters, and there was right. a lot of misinformation. They, they didn't really understand how it worked. They didn't understand how it worked, and when they saw the result, they weren't sure that they liked it, but also some parties really didn't like it. So, right. so it might be better for the individual voter and for the community as a whole, collectively looking at the voters, but not for the parties necessarily all the time. Right. Um, but the League of Women Voters, that's not our concern so much as how the parties feel about something. Is is it serving the voters? Right. Is it serving the voters? Right. right. Yeah. So it's it's an interesting um, uh, it's an interesting proposition. I think ranked choice voting um, is a subset of instant runoff voting, which people may be more familiar with. Right. I'm not sure if I'd say it was a subset of, I would have actually almost said instant runoff voting was a subset of ranked choice voting. But anyway, they're related. They're, they're not yeah. identical, but they're related. Right. Right. Yeah, and um, I think there's one country that uses it currently for national elections. I think Australia. Right, Australia. Does it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and they've had it for several decades, right? Quite a long while, yeah. right. And now, I'm not sure if this is true now, but a few years ago when I was first starting to look at this, um, you had to rank every choice. Like if there were eight candidates, you had to rank them all the way down to eight. Right. Um, so the idea was then you 100% would definitely have a majority on whoever the candidate was, even yeah. if it went through multiple right. rounds. Yeah. Um, if you tell people you rank as many as you want and it won't hurt your top candidate if you rank additional people, say there are, there are eight candidates and you only rank the top three or four, well if you rank the three or four least favorite people, then you will eventually not you know you, there won't be anybody to look at for your next vote right and then then you may actually not have a full majority right. um, but it still would have been closer so before we get too far down this road i think maybe we should back up a little bit and and let's go and do a brief description of of what ranked voting is um and i know we i know we have a quick clip that we can show that's yep. a good example of of how it works and then maybe you can kind of run us through um it in 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 layman's terms what it is how it works and what it's supposed to be accomplished so in ranked choice voting you rank your your order of preference for these folks and it, it's used already in many for like professional organizations it's used by motion academy awards you know motion picture awards it's used in a number of different settings um, as well as being used in some um, towns in america some um, countries some states only one state currently um, has proposed using it, um, but they have to work out constitutional issues. But the thing is, you, you, you rank your candidates, so you have your first choice, your second choice, your third choice, and your fourth choice. And now we can take a look at how that plays out. So just to show you how ranked choice voting would work so that you can actually see it, um, first, I'll just explain that there are four candidates, blue, pink, coral, whatever, yellow, and purple. And on the ballot, I would be putting down that blue is my first choice, coral is my second choice, then yellow, and then purple. And the way this looks on this board here is that the blue is on top of the coral, my second choice, on top of the yellow, and then my purple is my last choice. And then my vote is going to go counted with all the other blue first choices. OK? So that's how that looks. And um, so that was my sample. I'll put that down here again now. So everybody voted. One of these would be mine. And now we'll run through. All the people who voted for blue first choice are here. Yellow first choice are here. Purple first choice are here. And coral first choice are here. There are 20 voters, so to get at least 50%, because we want to have a majority of people supporting the final, the final selection, um, then we would need to have 11 voters. You know, half would be 10, you have to have at least one more. So that's 11 voters, and nobody got that many. The, longest, the largest one we have is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this person would need four more votes for them to actually win this outright. If they had gotten 11, the election would be done and they would have won. Now, though, we have to go to the next step. Um, since nobody got a majority, we look to see who got the least votes, and that would be yellow. And so with these yellow votes, we say, OK, so you, your, your candidate is eliminated, and who is your second choice? And we'll give those votes 
to your second choice. So this is going to go to blue. This will go to pink. And this will go to blue as well. So now we have 6 to 7 to 7. So the one that has the least votes is blue. And again, we'll be distributing those votes to the next choice. So I'll take off their second choice. It's actually the third choice for these two voters, you'll recall. And it's now down to the second choice for these other folks. And this person's already been eliminated too. So that will go down here. And you'll see now that Coral only got one of those votes and all the rest are going to purple. So the purple is going to win after all. You'll recall purple only had seven votes to start with. But once you see, you know, when some candidates are eliminated, what did they end up with? They have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So they have twelve votes total. Um, that's more than eleven, so they won this election. So hopefully that gave a little bit more of a, of an illustration. It's obviously a little, it's a little more complicated than an actual voting scenario, but that should give a pretty good idea of uh, of how this is supposed to work and what it's looking to achieve. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool system because it really takes into account, um, you know, trying to find, I think, the candidate that most people can get behind, right? Because uh, the candidate that can get the, you know, plurality of a vote in a, in a head-to-head um, election or a multi, you know, with multiple candidates in it, um, you know, they may be able to get their base excited. Right. They may not be able to win over or at least you know, win over other people that are in, um, that would vote for, for the other candidates in the race. So when you have, you know, a race where there's multiple seats that, or multiple people running for the same seat, I think is where you get a, a scenario where something like this makes a lot of sense. So this is a pretty cool system. Um, and can, you can get fairly complex with it when you have multiple candidates involved. What would you say the real benefits of a ranked choice voting system are? Well, the strongest benefit is that in the end, you hopefully do have a majority. And if people didn't all list all the way down to the end, then you may not have a majority, but it's way closer than what we currently do. Um, so, um, so you have the, the person who hopefully had the, you know, the majority support. And another benefit is that you have less negative campaigning because you can tell if, if you're saying nasty things about candidate A, if candidate A doesn't get enough votes and those people go to their second choice, do you think candidate A's you know, supporters are going to vote for you if you said nasty things about their candidate, their favorite candidate? True. So, um, so that reduces it by a lot. You, and it, it doesn't hurt to vote for your favorite person and then the other people that you also can tolerate or you also think would be good candidates or right. whatever your range is. And a lot of people are really concerned about that. They're like, oh, if I really vote for, um, if I really vote for, I uh, really, really want yellow, but actually, um, you know, pink is who is going to win or purple is who is going to win. You know, but I know in the end it's going to be one of those two candidates. Right. Am I wasting my vote to vote for yellow? Right. And that's something that I think a lot of voters struggle with is like, am I, I really like this candidate. I don't really think they have a chance. D am I wasting my vote by voting for them? Right. So we, ha we call the splitting the vote and wasting your vote are two things voters are very concerned about. And the League of Women Voters wants people to feel that their vote counts, that every person's got a vote. And that, um, and that people will um, be enthusiastic about going to the polls, not stay home because, well, my vote doesn't count anyway. Right. You know, I wanted yellow and they're never going to win, so I'll stay home. Or, um, well, you know, yellow and pink are similar in their views, and if I vote for yellow, that will, that will take a vote away from pink and maybe purple will win instead or something like that. Yeah. So, um, so it, it really gives people more sense of choice and, right. and ownership. Yeah, and, it, and I think it makes sense, um, you know, 
having when you have a race with multiple candidates, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have mm -hmm. like a three-way race or a four-way right. race, right? Um, for one seat, it makes a lot of sense to do something like this because there are some states that have runoff elections, right? Um, and and this is kind of basically a runoff for all intents and purposes, but. Um, it allows you to, to do a runoff um, vote calculation by counting your votes, but not have to hold a whole new election, which is expensive, and then you don't have as much turnout in your runoff Absolutely. as you do in your original one. Right. You run into all those ki kinds of problems where, right. you know, if you have a vote that's that close, this you can do it one vote, and you can capture all of that in one. Right, right. So if you need to buy different computer systems or print up different ballots, that can be a somewhat added expense. However, if you can eliminate the primary, that's a huge expense you get rid of. And yeah. if you can eliminate any runoffs, and you wouldn't have had a, a runoff if there was a clear majority to begin with. Right. So you may not be saving money on that and if it wasn't going to happen anyway. But if there is a runoff. Now the problem is that, uh, well one problem is that um, some of these decisions about whether an election requires a majority or if just a plurality will win, it's all you know state by state and within a state and maybe town by town about right. what are the rules for how that works. So that in, um, in Vermont, um, for instance, our, um, our U.S. House and Senate seats are just by plurality. Right. So that's where you can have that, you know, the vote splitting. So if you have um, one candidate who may be perceived as liberal and two who are perceived as conservative, people who are conservative are like torn on which one do they think is going to win because they don't want to, they want to vote for the one they think will win to make sure that they get somebody that they like. And, you know, and that's really unfortunate to have people having to think that way instead of thinking right. who I think would be the best candidate. Which, yeah, exactly, is trying to make that calculation of who's the most, who's going to be the most successful candidate, not right. necessarily who's going to represent me the best. Right, right. Yeah, and the other thing about um, ranked choice voting, if you, um, if you can have more than two candidates from a party, then that really frees up the party to right. have, um, have more choices on the ballot. So for instance, if you have an incumbent and they've been in there for 10 or 15 or whatever years and some people think, you know, they kind of like some fresh blood, and other people are like, wow, we really don't want to lose that seat, and he hasn't, so he or she isn't saying that they want to, you know, back down yet. We don't want to push them out. All that, all that stuff, you know. Um, you can just run both candidates, and it doesn't hurt your incumbent to have a newcomer try it out. Right. Yeah, and, and it, what I think is where a system like this could be really valuable for Vermont. We we don't have too many races statewide where you have more than one candidate in a race, except for in a primary, right? But if we had um, open generals and we got rid of primaries, then a system like this would make a whole lot of sense, I think. Right. So, yeah, so they're, they're different, it happens different in different years. So, for instance, a few years ago, we had five candidates just in the Democratic primary right. for governor. Yep. And seriously, none of them had even 30. They all were in the 20s or lower. Right. <laughs> and so they're all pretty close. So, in a circumstance like that, um, it's harder to see whether you know whether the first person that gets eliminated was liked so closely to the other three that maybe they would have been you know favored more by some of the other folks but it still is so much better that if you have somebody in that in that one you automatically give it to the one who got 26 instead of 24 percent right <laughs> and I'm, I'm just thinking I'm thinking back to the 2010 primary when, where Peter Shumlin won that's what and, I'm talking about and I think the margin was actually more than or less than two or three percent I think it was like one and a half percent. it was small yeah um, like I said there were like 22 to 25 and it was or like 26. yeah exactly it was like three percent from one to like fourth place it uh -huh. was like kind of what it was right right and um, and when you have it a race that's that close. It would have been nice to drop off the bottom candidate and see where those votes exactly. went. Exactly, and see, and see yeah. where those votes went. Yeah, yeah. 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 The other thing in Vermont is that, um, you know, I had said we have the plurality voting for our U.S. House and Senate. However, we require a majority for our governor. Right. Uh, we require a majority for the governor to be declared a winner in the election, but mm -hmm. if if there's not, we don't actually do a runoff for our governor. We put it into the, the legislature. legislature. And this almost happened two two years ago, four years ago, with uh, um, Scott Milne, because Shumlin did not get a majority, and so it went to the legislature. Right, right. So yeah, I'm not sure why you said almost, because it actually it did. did. It did. <laughs> okay. It did go to the... I was thinking, did I miss right. something there? <laughs> yeah. 
Right, no, it did. And so from the League of Women Voters perspective, that's not honoring the voters' wishes because you're guessing. You're guessing how the other 8% of people who voted for whatever other candidates were on there, the Libertarian, the, you know, the, the Green Party, whatever, all those votes in a rank, you know, in a rank choice voting system, they would have been distributed. You, you would know what the voters actually you know, wanted. Yeah. And here you have legislators sitting there saying, "Well, I think we really need to vote for the plurality one because that was the will of the people." And it's like, "No, nah, we don't know the will of the people." Right. And if you choose, well, you know, maybe if you can tell looking at the other three candidates, who do we think those people would have wanted for a second choice? But but politicians are very nervous about their next election, and they're worried their constituents will, you know, second guess them and think that they yeah. didn't do the right thing and whatever. I remember this being a major debate at the time in, among the legislators about, mm -hmm. well, do I vote for the plurality candidate or do I vote with the way my district went? Right. And how do like how right. am I? What, what do I, I vote my conscience? Like, what, you know, what do you right. do in that situation? Right. And the ranked choice voting would would give you the answer. Right. 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 It wouldn't be thrown to the legislature. Right. So another. Um, place that ranked choice voting is used actually um, in Louisiana for um, a number of years, like 20 or more years. Um, they've had ranked choice voting for the presidential um, primaries for, oh, for military and other overseas people because mm -hmm. of the issue around getting, um, if the primary, something happens different and then you can't print out the ballot in time for the changes right. for and the mail general it and election. Get it back right, right. And, yeah. and so Louisiana has been doing it the longest and they actually do their House and Senate that way too. And then there's a couple other um, states that have done it more recently. I think Alabama and um, Mississippi. Yep. And that's because um, states officiate their uh, the presidential primaries, correct? Right. They're not a, they're not actually a federally officiated election. Right. Like the general is, is that correct? Well, wait, actually, so the general, the results of the general are that you're actually technically voting for an elector. Right. And then the states have to follow strict rules about what happens with those votes. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, I mean, the electors can get guidance from laws that we write. So for instance, in Vermont, um, legislators, electors rather, electors are required to vote for a person in the same party as, how do I put this? So when you vote, if you think you're voting for candidate A for the election and that person's like who has been across the country campaigning everything, you're not actually voting for candidate A, you're voting for the electors who have promised to pay, to, to vote for candidate A. Right. And so if something happens and candidate A is suddenly not available or if the electors suddenly decide that candidate A is not an appropriate candidate because something has come out in the news or whatever, those electors have to choose somebody else from the same party. They can't just get somebody else random. Right. They have to choose somebody from the same party. And state by state, some are tied that way to parties, some are tied um, by other ways, and some are not tied. Which is an interesting. Yeah, that's it's, it, it, pres presidential elections in particular are very interesting. In yeah, they are yeah. complicated, and there's a, yeah, yeah another whole topic on that one is yeah. the uh, national compact on the electoral college, which we probably so won't go into now. Could you theoretically put a rank? Could a state theoretically put a rank choice voting method in place for a federal election? For the presidential primary, you could. For the presidential primary, but not necessarily for a presidential general. I am not aware of how that could work right now with the way the U.S. Constitution yeah, is. I would think that would be tricky. Right. So it's more for senators and House members and all the state elected officials, governors, um, you know, state's attorneys, all those sorts of the secretary of state, all those sorts of things. And what, what challenges are there? Are there any problems that an, an IRV system yeah. uh, presents? Well, actually, if you don't mind us going back a little bit, I wanted to make sure that um, that we talked about the rest of the pros. Um, oh, that, sure, right, yeah. Right. So one thing is that um, the ranked choice voting, we talked about some of the issues around strategic voting, um, about people saying, well, I don't want to vote for this person who has no, no chance, or I don't want to split a vote, that sort of thing. There are other ways that elections can work that um, maybe better than plurality voting, but they have more problems with strategic voting. And the instant runoff voting of the various choices has the least problem with strategic voting. And so that's, that's one of the benefits. And another one, um, we did talk about saving money. 
Right. Okay. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. So in, in the end, basically, um, it reflect has a better reflection of what the what the voters actually wanted. Right. Exactly. You get to okay. a, a candidate that most of the that the majority of voters can can get behind, even if it's not their first right. choice. It's someone they can live right. with. Right. So as far as the cons. Um, the main one is that people aren't familiar with it. Right. And so anything new, there's going to be a certain percentage of people who don't want to change. Because how do you know what unintended consequences there might be? So you know they don't want to change from what they're doing now. And we would definitely need to do some education around um, why you're doing it so people will be willing to change. And then how do you actually do it? Right. How do you implement it? Right. Right. And. Um, the the ballots the print making might be more expensive because you have more columns on it so you might have to have a second piece of paper or something and um, the computer programming would be a little different so there might be more ex some expense in that end but you remember you're saving the money on the end with the primaries if you're able to get rid of the primaries right so you're getting rid of the whole whole election is there has there been any um, how receptive has you know people you've talked to or people in government in the legislature been to the concept of moving towards either a, um, an instant runoff method of some sort mm -hmm. um, or uh, getting rid of a primary and making it an open general? Have, have you gotten any pushback on that? From so um, I had approached um, several legislators, some that had, um, oh, so I didn't actually mention that there was a ranked choice voting bill, a limited one, just for the presidential primary for people who were military and overseas. That somebody had, uh, I can't remember who was the one who sponsored that bill. And I was trying to get my own legislators in St. Johnsbury to, um, to co-sponsor. And, um, and I was not successful. And one thing is that um, you pretty much have to get the Secretary of State on board to mm -hmm. do a major election change before legislators will want to sign on to it, since that's the person who has to implement it. They have to implement it. Right. And he was, the, um, Jim Condos, the Secretary of State, was saying there are other changes coming up um, regarding how we're going to be voting as far as electronic voting and things. Right. That, that um, he didn't think that this was a good time to do that kind of a bill. So right. it was not raised at all. I mean, you know, it had been, it had been, uh, what do you call it? When you put a bill out there, but then it gets basically hacked to the bulletin board and never yeah, gets off. Yeah, it gets Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it was introduced, but it was not, introduced. That's but, right. But right. not moved out of committee. Right, right, yeah. right, right. And um, so the thing is that um, I do think it'd be a good idea to move forward with the governor issue um, for ranked choice voting for that position, and. Um, some folks are, well, one thing is we have an election coming up right now. So it, the people who are, you might meet with over the summertime are like busy campaigning if they're running again. Um, and if, and they're not sure if they're going to be there. So how much time do they want to put in looking at this bill right now? Right. Um, and so, yeah, it might be, yeah, I'm not sure whether it be, would be better to try to um, approach them again in like that November time after the election. They know one way or the other. Right. Um, I know that um, Dick McCormick is interested in it again. He's supported it in the past, um, but he'd be very interested. Um, uh, Senator Kitchell um, from my area is um, is concerned about you know the bad press that it got when they tried it in Burlington. When they and, tried it in Burlington, yeah. And um, you know, do we want to wait and see how it works other places some more? But the thing is, like, it's actually it's out there. It's successfully being yeah. used in like four towns in the Bay Area in San Francisco. It's been used in Minneapolis and St. Paul in Minnesota. Um, it's being used in Portland, Maine. So we have experience out there. Right. And it was successful enough in Maine that the state of Maine decided, not the legislature. The legislature and the governor were opposed, but there were enough grassroots organizations out there educating the public that they got a referendum yep. to say that they wanted um, wanted uh, ranked choice voting. The problem with having a referendum, now we don't have that process in Vermont, but if you have a state that allows a referendum, then the way the question is worded is not vetted by people who have really looked at like your state constitution and stuff. And so there's issues about whether the law as currently written is um, valid, constitutional, constitutional yeah. right. And if you had asked the legislators to help you write it up, 
then you could have had something that would ca pass Constitution muster. They, and the legislators, because they weren't involved, they in didn't it, aren't, want, aren't really that interested in fixing it. <laughs> well, and there are a number of them that don't want it. Right. Want, don't want it anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, are there any circumstances? There's clearly a lot of cases where this is a is mm -hmm. a good option. Mm -hmm. Are there any circumstances where this might not be the strongest option? Does this translate well to if you're trying to elect multiple people for a specific role? That's or? a great question. So um, actually, um, League of Women Voters um, across the country has supported um, having uh, multiple member districts for a lot of different kinds of positions. So for instance, if when you're looking at, um, you know, well, St. Johnsbury has a multiple member district. We have two um, House members and we can, you know, vote for two. Um, and, you know, Burlington has six House members. I'm not sure whether each one is a different geographic location and you, or whether, and you only vote for one or whether they it's, vote for it is, um, it's a mixed bag. There are a couple of multi-member okay. districts, mm -hmm. House districts. Yep. The big one, though, is Chittenden County has six Senate seats. And yeah. that, that is, a, um, there's been a lot of discussion about that. Well, that's really interesting because um, the idea that in all of the Burlington area, there are zero Republicans. Now, I don't actually belong to a party, but it just seems funny to me that there would be six Democratic seats and zero Republican seats in a city the size of that. And the proportional representation with multi-member seats allows you to have um, have members that more accurately represent the district. Right. So that's another whole topic so I don't think we'll have time about for today. So multi-member district, and, and I think Chittenden County is kind of an extreme example where you have six seats that mm -hmm. people are running for. And, um, one of the interesting things, kind of looking at the results from um, the primary that was just a few weeks ago, is there is a huge spread in the number of votes that each of those candidates are getting, even within one party. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where you have the top vote getter getting twice as many votes as the bottom vote getter. Uh -huh. uh, and when you have that large of a spread, it, it really is difficult to say that, you know, all of those seats are representing the population of. Um, of uh -huh. that geographic area. And I think right. even in other places where you have multi-member districts, uh, you you run into some of those same issues. And mm -hmm. Chittenden County is just kind of an extreme example of that. Right, right. Right, the whole multi-member district um, is not something that we've spent a lot of time here in Vermont and League of Women Voters, but I can definitely appreciate that if somebody said, this is a problem, can you help us study and can you help us promote a particular kind of legislation, if it was something that would look like it would make our elections provide more representative government, then we would be happy to look at that sort of thing. Yeah, I think it's just an interesting interesting case study where you could apply something like this. Because I see, um, you know, I know back in 2014 there was some interest uh, in looking at this um, mm -hmm. both by the Senate Government mm -hmm. Operations Committee um, and at the time I was working with Campaign for Vermont we, we did look at this and, mm -hmm. and supported the um, you know they were looking really at uh, instant runoff voting different various forms uh -huh. of instant runoff mm -hmm. and um, so, so um, maybe we could just explain for the listeners for those who don't mind something really tedious here <laughs> right. if you're still here on, on this show with us at this point so in instant runoff voting Right. You'll remember we had these four different colors up here. Instead of just taking off one tab to look at to, to look at just the yellows were the ones with the least number, you would have taken all of the yellow and all of the blue. Right. And only looked at the top two candidates. And for each of those groups, you would have taken the second choice for each of them, unless they happened to like be each other. Like if it was both yellow and blue were the first and second choices, you'd go down to see what was the, which candidate of the top two got the highest ranking for each of those voters. Right. Um, so that those numbers would have been distributed down. So if with only one round, no matter how many candidates you have, if nobody got the majority vote on the first round, only two candidates advanced to the instant round. Right, the, t the top two advanced right. and not all but the bottom. Right. Yep. Yeah, and, and it's an interesting, um, it's just an interesting concept of trying to get to, you know, again, get to the candidate or candidates in a multi-seat district mm -hmm. that best represent the people of right. that and, district. And that's actually how the bill was that um, that Jim Condos had sponsored when he was a senator. And right. I don't know if that was for a constitutional reason or some reason, because the instant runoff voting does, the um, 
the ranked choice voting does provide a, a better representation of the voters' wishes. Right. But did he choose to sponsor the instant runoff voting bill because it was easier to administer or because it was constitutionally easier to know it wouldn't get challenged? Or yeah, and reason? there's there are some questions. There were some questions. I know when I worked on that issue in 2014, there were some questions around. Um, constitutionality because of one one person one vote mm -hmm. um, and I think you we run into those anyway with the multi-seat districts because you're casting six votes mm -hmm. um, so so we kind of have those in play anyway in our system mm -hmm. um, but you know there's some questions around that and I think there wasn't there just wasn't a you know advocate in the state house that was really like we need to move towards this they were kind of curious about it yeah and f folks like the league, league of women voters was involved in mm -hmm. the conversation at that point um campaign for vermont was involved in the conversation um you know and uh um, even um uh, vermont public interest research group was mm -hmm. involved uh and again there wasn't a huge really strong advocate it just kind of come up there's some questions around yeah. it and yeah. you know all of us kind of agreed that was a good direction to move in but there wasn't really the the drive behind it wasn't it. had the drive to get a legislator to actually push to it to actually push right, it right, yeah right. right so the the districting um is a concern in a lot of states it's not a concern for vermont for our um U.S. Congress seats because we only have one exactly. in the House. One, yeah. Everybody votes for our the senator who's up for a re-election, which you know we have one one year, another one two years later, and then none the other set because they're in for six years and there's right. only two. Um, but um, but with the House members, we only get one, so you can't gerrymander the district at all for one candidate. Right, right. <laughs> so that's the one that would be really good to have you know ranked choice voting for too. And and the thought is the thought. For the for the League of Women Voters to is to get rid of the the primary for statewide elections and, and then use this as kind of a way around, you know, to open that general election up a little bit more. Right, and you might have to look at it. I mean, for instance, um, you know, if you have 13 candidates running for one seat, right. then the instant runoff voting um, is less reflective. I mean, because you've had everybody is so diluted. At so that diluted, point. right? Um, that it may be harder to say that that really represents. So it might be that if a part, and so if one can party has like you know 13 candidates and another party has five, right? And then you have a couple other people from other parties. It's just so many. Um, it might be you'd have to have a limit. Like if one party has more than three, then they should throw their party primary, but they should pay for it themselves. Like right now, it's on the voters' back to pay for right. those primaries. And if you guys can't sit down and talk together and figure out like only two candidates or only three candidates then you know go pay for it yourself <laughs> right right yeah and that makes i think that makes some sense where you like if you have 20 i, I seem to remember uh, i can't remember if it was uh 2014 i think um where there was like 12 candidates running for governor and it made i think the the picture of one of the debates with these 12 candidates made the front page and well like the our the, presidential in 2016 you right. had yeah, many. exactly. In many, <laughs> um, and that's where like a primary system is actually kind of helpful because it weeds that down to right, you know, to right. just a few by the end of it. Right, and with the presidential campaign, these are people that are running across the whole country. Like in right. Vermont, we know our candidates, or we can find out about them pretty quickly, and so I'm not as worried about the primaries. Um, if you didn't have a primary at all, then you'd have to figure out what's going to be your vetting process for the presidents because for right. one thing you could have 50 candidates I mean seriously I think New Hampshire has a very low threshold for letting you get your name on the ballot and yeah. they'll have like 20 or 30 people on yeah. there yeah <laughs> like, exactly <laughs> yeah and you have candidates you know people and, that you can get on the ballot and are just campaigning in New Hampshire you know right right exactly. right and so if you um, if you can if you if you know that a whole mess of them are only going to get one percent you'll have a couple of standouts then maybe it doesn't really matter that you have that many but if you're gonna have like you know you're going to have you know, t 12 candidates, and a lot of them have around seven or eight percent. Then you don't have anybody standing out, and that just makes it really, really hard to know what to do with that. So one question, and we kind of touched on it briefly early on, um, that I have is, um, you know, what is this? How is this going to impact candidates and how they run their campaigns? Like, what what effect is this going to have on how how a candidate runs? Right. So um, one thing we had mentioned is that there would be less negative campaigning. Right. And a whole lot of the money that is spent is spent on negative campaigning. Right. So we're anticipating that it, you could run an election with less money. 
because you wouldn't need to spend so much money to counter those negative ads that were thrown out there at you and you're having to defend yourself and you're not trying to meet them with also having awful <laughs> negative ads. Right. Which to me also just sounds wonderful for the voters because I am just so sick of watching negative ads. Right. I mean, freedom of speech, yeah, but I can't get away from that. Like, <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> follows you. I mean, it's what, you know, first week in September, I can, about three weeks from now, they're gonna start up and they're gonna, you're gonna uh -huh. we're gonna be living with them for five or six weeks. <laughs> right, right, right. So, and um, and yeah, you can choose where you wanna go read something on the internet right. or which newspapers you subscribe to. You know, you can choose which TV shows you turn on to, but you can't choose what commercials are thrown at you. Right, exactly. <laughs> and how often they come or and how, how negative they are. <laughs> and it's one of those, you know, I, I don't know, I, I agree that it probably will decrease the, mm -hmm. you know, the frequency of negative, at least from campaigns themselves. I mean, you can't really, if there's, mm -hmm. you know, political action committees involved and stuff mm -hmm. like that, you can't really control. The candidates, really, we can't really control those? The candidates can't control those, but if they have strategists on their team, they should say, gee, this could backfire on us if, if, you know, if we're throwing, throwing slinging mud at that, can, that votes candidates, right. then well, the one we prefer not ever get selected you know, on the lower counts. Right, on, on so you can, you can do things like, you know, uh, and some candidates have talked about doing this where you know, they just basically say, if you're thinking about starting a pack to support me, don't. Like, just stay away. And, uh -huh. you know, you can do that. Um, legally, you can't coordinate with a pack to say, don't. You know, you can't talk to them as right. a candidate. So you right. have to. And PACs is another whole issue. And that's a whole, another whole yeah, issue. So let's yeah. not go there. At a federal weird. level, that's a whole other. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, so, so, yeah, so, like, what, you know, how else do you think this would impact the way that, you know, candidates run their campaign? Well, yeah, this is interesting. So um, I was speaking to someone from, um, uh, from Berkeley in California where they have ranked choice voting and she said um, in the early years when they started doing it two candidates who had similar positions and they talked to each other about well you know which one of us should run and I really this is a good time in my life for me to do it. and the other one says well yeah it's actually if I'm gonna do it, this is a time for me too and they had very similar positions but instead of um, deciding which one of us will run and which one won't, they actually went door to door together. They knocked on doors together, <laughs> they gave out of their brochures and said, yeah, we're very similar. If you like him better, please list me second. <laughs> so there that, you go. And there were some, some voters that were really confused. It's like, but aren't you running against each other? So it really had to be explained to them, yeah, it doesn't hurt me though. If, you know, whichever one you like better, you know, vote for that one and yeah. Yeah. Um, was this a multi-seat district? Or no. Was it, no, this it was, was a single seat. This was a single wow, seat. Oh, interesting. And, but yeah, but they figured that, you know, if you knew them because your daughter was on the Girl Scout team or they went to your church or whatever the thing is, and you knew them personally, and you preferred one over the other, or if you just thought this person might be more effective at negotiating or was less partisan or more partisan or whatever, if there was some reason you liked one better than the other one, but you liked their positions, which were quite similar, mm -hmm. you would list the one you liked better. And since they were quite similar, you were likely to list the other one next, unless there was another candidate also that had a similar position. But that's interesting. It was very interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah, and actually, um, someone was telling me that one of the uh, the cons that Burlington experienced was that, like, gosh, there was one candidate who was actually out there saying, "If I'm not your first choice, vote for me second choice," and that was perceived by some people as being a negative. To me. What's wrong with that? <laughs> I don't right. see a problem with that. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and I think, you know, Burlington, um, we don't have a ton of time to talk about it, but I think, you know, Burlington didn't really advertise well the, the changes that they were making right. um, and how to use the new voting system. And they kind of had an election that a lot of people were confused about the results of. And, right. You know, all right. Um, so Burlington was kind of a situation, I think, of, um, you know, where it, a, it wasn't explained well, but then, you know, there was, uh, um, it doesn't, ranked choice voting doesn't really favor parties. Uh, it really puts the weight back into, you know, onto voters to decide who they want representing them. Um, and so for parties, especially establishment parties, I think, uh, you know, they're able to cast that as, oh, we don't want this because it's not reflective of our interests as a party, not necessarily the interests of people. Right. I don't know what your take is on that. Yeah, um, I, I would agree. Yeah. Um, now that they would say it that way. Now that they would say it that way, but that's <laughs> but that essentially. that would be the underlying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Where it's like, you know, this is not 
were good for our interests, so therefore it's not good for anyone's interest. That type right, of thing. and the League of Women Voters supports it because they are not concerned about the parties; they're concerned about right. the voters. The voters, and, and making sure that you know whoever is elected is representative of the voters. Right, right. Thank you. So, um, anything else we should know about ranked choice voting? We've only got two minutes left um, in our show tonight. So, like, what's if there's one thing that that our guests need to know about ranked choice voting, what is that? Uh, well, if you wanted to help <laughs> on the education process, even if you're not sure that's what you want, if you want to learn more about it, you could contact the League of Women Voters and ask them to do a presentation for you, or they could send you a slideshow and you could, you know, we have the, the materials that Maine used um, that we can share. Um, if you want to speak with your local legislator, and see if we could um, get more sponsors or at least find out from them you know, what their concerns are and you know, we could figure out a strategy for how to move forward with getting this more representative form of voting. And Vermont doesn't have a, a referendum system, so we can't just go out and say, hey, we want to pass this law right. uh, the way that Maine did. But um, if, if people do want to move down this road, what's the best way to get involved and to start, um, and start moving the needle? Uh, well, like I said, you can contact the League of Women Voters of Vermont, and um, the uh, the website we can flash on the yeah, screen. Yeah, we'll here. put it up right on the screen yeah. for you. Okay, great. And um, yeah, one way to find it, if you can't remember the other one, if you don't have a pencil to write down while it's on there, is um, if you go to the lwv.org website, and then on there there will be a little box you can put in your zip code, and and click find a league and then when you, your zip code will have given you Vermont and there are choices of those two little leagues I had mentioned that are big enough to actually be leagues instead of just units and right. then it says the Vermont and just click on the Vermont one to get more information you can send in you know, look at the website from there um, get our get our, our web page from the top of that awesome Betty, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, this is a really me. interesting topic. I'm Great talking with you. I always love talking about these types of things. Yeah. And uh, thank you for watching. I hope you'll join us again next week. And until then, keep listening beyond the sound bites.